All right, here we go. Let's start our AP World Midterm Review. It is a, It has been a very busy semester from period one through four, so let's get started and make sure that we are ready for this county exam. Now, before we really get started, we need to make sure that we know our themes. Now, we do spice themes every single week. I know it's all of your favorite thing that you do every single week. It's the most time consuming. It is a pain in the butt to do, but it is something that keeps showing up. It's in our CCOTs, it's in our CCs, as well, of course, in our DBQs. So themes are such a huge component. Now, these are not in the same order as your spice themes, but um, we're just going to connect, we're going to review what each theme is. Now, interactions between human and environment are focusing on diseases, migration, patternments of settlement, and technology. That is how humans are shaping and molding the earth, as well as what things are coming from the earth. Now, the trickiest part of this part of this is knowing that it's humans moving and disease. The environment would kind of make sense, but I can understand the confusion between migration and demography. So those fall into this category as well. Development of interaction of culture. Culture is one of the hardest things I've always found out that my students do struggle with. What's the difference between culture and social? Culture is your religion, it's your belief system, philosophies, ideologies, science, technology, arts, and architecture. So when we deal with interaction of cultures, we're dealing with religions, belief systems, um, and arts and architecture. Now, state building, expansion, and conflict, that is our government structures. This is our political structures and form of governance, empires, um, the expansion of empires more specifically, nations, nationalism, revolts, revolution, regional trade, trans-regional trade, and global structures and organizations. So anything that's run by the government, controlled by the government, manipulated by the government is going to fall under state building and expansion of conflict. We then have creation of expansion and interaction of economic systems, which is all of your economic components, which is agriculture and pastoral production, trade and commerce, labor systems, individual indiv industrialization, which we're coming up on very quickly, capitalism, and socialism. So anything that is an economic system is going to fall in this category. Anything that deals with the economic component of any society will fall here. Now, social structures and the development and transformation of social structures is going to be your gender roles and gender relations, your family and your kinship, your racial and ethnic, ethnic constructions, as well as your social and economic classes. Now, when you think of social structures and cultures, like I said, most students struggle with this. Culture means every single person in that society is participating in it. So it's your different types of religions, a much bigger, broader base, while social structures are more um, individualized and more specific. So now that we've reviewed our themes, let's get going. So of course, you have to start at the beginning. So period one. Now period one is 8,000 BCE to 600 BCE. Now in this stage, humans are evolving from hunting and gathering into, into agriculture, which allows for more permanent settled civilizations. Um, now our foundation of civilization is Mesopotamia, Indus River Valley, Yellow River Valley. Keep in mind, the Mesopotamians are our first civilization. We we'll also have the Phoenicians in there as well. Now the Phoenicians are going to be great traders as well. The River Valley is going to be our Chinese and the Indus is our um, South Asia or India. Now the reasons, one of the big things that comes out of period one is governments. Now we live in a world today we couldn't imagine uh, living without a government, but this is the time when we're creating government and we find that governments are getting created the moment people of different ethnicities, backgrounds, and clans start living together and building projects are starting to really increase. Now, we're going to see that governments are required, much like we need them today, for diverse populations, being fair and balanced to all populations and not benefiting one, keeping organization, making sure things are supposed to work the way they're supposed to, um, settle money, land, and trade problems, which is still what the government's trying to do today, as well as making sure that clans aren't, um, clans are making sure that everyone is working together and not against each other. 
Now, Mesopotamia, like I said, is going to be the first civilization. It's located between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. It is the first to de develop a style of writing. It's called cuneiform. Now, keep in mind, I have major pictures and uh, major pictures of the civilization as well as its writing style. So please make sure you are taking a look at the writing style. This is cuneiform. It is written into a uh, wet clay palette and is done with a reed. Uh, one of the interesting things about Mesopotamia is that there's not many buildings that really survive. Yes, we have a ziggurat right here. It's a very massive structure. This is from ancient Mesopotamia. However, we're not going to see it's going to be as built up as, say, the Egyptians. The reason why the infrastructure of Mesopotamia is not as advanced or as large as the Egyptians because of the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. The Tigris and the Euphrates do not have a reliable flood pattern. They swell and overflow and run their banks at different times every year and are, no, are not on a regulated schedule. Now, this is going to cause a lot of problems because it's going to put a lot of stress on the government. When the government's under stress, citizens are under stress. When citizens are under stress, governments are likely to be challenged more directly. And that's what we're going to see is going to be caused by the inconsistent flowing pattern. Now, we're also going to see complications from the lack of unification and continuing outside invasions, which will eventually lead to their demise. Remember, this is the first civilization. We have learned from previous civilizations' mistakes, and that's why the United States has been so successful. But you and I both know the United States have lots of things it needs to improve on in order to become a better government for all people. Well, Mesopotamia is the first one, so they've got a lot of problems, and they're dealing with a lack of unification problem, how to keep everyone under organized and working together and not trying to kill each other, which is a big problem. Next, let's head to Egypt. Now, Egypt, like we've talked about in comparison to Mesopotamia, has, is based along the Nile River in, nor in Africa. Now, the river itself, as we've mentioned, is incredibly reliable. It floods essentially the same week every single year. It starts the flooding, and then it withdraws about the same time every single year. So since the Nile River's flooding pattern is so consistent, the Egyptians are able to focus on irrigation, they're able to focus on infrastructure, and their ability to focus on government-run projects. Now, the Egyptians, because the river is so consistent, they have large irrigation uh, systems that provide vast amount of surplus agriculture because they have so much food, they can really focus on other things like becoming priests, developing a state religion um, in a massive scale and very involved in the government, as well as build things like pyramids and sphinx and massive cities like Alexandria, all of these big monstrous cities and relics that we still have today is based on the fact that they have such a surplus amount of crops because of the river, because of the massive irrigation systems. Now, we're also going to see that the Egyptians are going to be writing hieroglyphics, which we can see as an example down below. You can see how they are super structured and they have a nice line to keep them all organized. Yeah, you can see they're kind of pictogrammish, but they have nice clear lines. Now, the Indus River Valley, located in South Asia, or India, is located along the Ganges River. It is, the written language is known as Sanskrit, which you can see in the picture below the picture, which is very uh, Lord of the Rings writing style, if you ask me. Now, the Aryans are going to be one of the first civilizations of India. They're one of the first two. They are going to develop the caste system. Now, the caste system is going to have lingering effects even here to this day, uh, present day. And as you know, because they're AP World, you know how impactful and how important they are. Now, the agricultural surplus of the Indus River Valley is going to allow them to start trading on a larger scale. Um, they're going to stay inter-regional 
not intra-regional, um, but we do see them starting to trade, just like the Phoenicians. Now, the end of the Ganges River is very reliable, uh, which allowed infrastructure to be built, but not on the Egyptian scale, because they're going to not focus on building up their infrastructure, but instead on trade. Now, the Yellow River Valley is located between the Honghe River and the Yangtze River. Now, this is going to be in China. Um, much like Mesopotamia, the Yellow River or R Yellow River Valleys is going to be built up of rivers that do not have a consistent uh, flooding pattern. Uh, Every time it floods, it's called China's sorrow because the damage is so overwhelming. Because uh, the damage is so overwhelming, we're going to see that they are going to try to stabilize their government as best they know how. And they're going to stabilize it by creating a dynastic system, which is going to be based off the mandate of heaven in order to give legitimacy to the government in order to help stabilize like we saw in Mesopotamia, when pe the flooding of the river is inconsistent, we see that governments struggle to show power and to show uh, force. So what the Yellow River does, uh, they start creating a dynastic, uh, dynastic cycle, which allows them to keep power and to show authority. Now, the Yellow River is going to depend very heavily on rice production, and they're also going to write in pictographs, which are more pictures and more unstructured than we would say the hieroglyphics of Egypt. All right, period two. 600 BCE to 600 CE is known as the classical period. This is where we're going to have civilizations like Rome, Persia, and uh, the Hellenistic empires. We're also going to see uh, the development of major religions, Christianity, Buddhism, Confucianism, legalism, and starting to develop development of massive trade connections. We're going to see the foundation of inter-regional trade, which we're going to start seeing um, uh, sh shipping connections between India and Africa, uh, between the Middle East and Africa, Middle East and India, all these different things, as well as the fall of Rome and the rise of Buddhism. Now, the trade routes are going to be a huge thing that's going to develop during period two. Interregional trade is when we are going from one region to another. Now, I know you know your regions. We've been talking about regions since the moment you walked into AP World. Some of the new interregionals, regions that we've been discussing through period two are from the southeast of Asia to Africa. Now, they're going to be traveling along the Indian Ocean Basin, and they're going to be tra trading major items like bananas. Now, to you and I, the idea of trading bananas doesn't sound like a big idea. However, it's going to transform uh, Africa because of the amount of protein and the amount of vitamins in banana is going to lead to a massive population increase. East Asia to Europe, the Silk Road is starting and trading in silk and spices. So we're going to start seeing that goods are going to be moving from East Asia to Europe. Now, the Silk Road really isn't going to take off until after the Crusades when Europeans have a true thirst for uh, West Eastern goods, but we're going to see the foundations of it are going to start here in period two. Now, intra-regional trade is when it's all in one region. We're going to see that trade is going to start from northern Africa, and this is called the Trans-Saharan trade. So items from North Africa are going to start trickling down to sub-Saharan desert um, items like gold, gold gems, and slaves. Now keep in mind, the Roman Empire is going to conquer the northern part of Africa, that whole thick band. Think back to your maps. And they're going to be going in and buying a lot of the gold and gems as well as the slaves from Africa and bring them back to the Roman Empire. Now, as you can tell that we're talking about trade, trade is a huge focus of period two. All throughout period two, civilizations are adjusting their environment in order to build more successful trading powers. For instance, we're going to see the Grand Canal is going to be built in East Asia where we're trying to accelerate trade. 
we're going to have the Mediterranean region is going to be building roads. This is going to be allowing the military to travel faster. This is going to allow goods to move faster as well as um, make sure that the government slash military can put down any type of rebellion. And this is going to be done by both the Persians and the Romans. Now, we're also going to see roads develop in Southeast Asia. The road system, which was going to be started by the Persians, is then going to be continued to be uh, expanded upon because of the benefit of the trade as well as the government regulation. So, all of these things, whether it's a canal or road systems, are all going to be used to improve the movement of trade, to make trade better, faster, and more efficient for everyone. Now, going back into Africa, we're looking at migrations. Now, in Africa, we're going to have the Bantu, who are going to be moving around Africa because they're being forced to leave. They keep getting kicked around throughout the entire period and still don't really have any rest. Now, the good thing about the Bantu migration is that they're going to create kind of a unification of language. Most languages, almost 80% of all languages in Africa are going to be based off the Bantu um, language. Because of their movement throughout this entire period, we're going to see their influence uh, lasting throughout Africa and into today. And that's why they've become so influential. They're also going to take with them the most important technology of the day, which is metallurgy or the creation of metals. Every time they get kicked out, they're going to bring that new information to a new region, and that new region is going to be bettered because of this new uh, knowing how to deal with metals. Uh, another major population migration is going to be the Indo-Europeans. Now, the Indo-Europeans are going to be moving from Central Europe and centralized Europe, and they're going to be spreading all the way to the west coast of Europe and east coast of Europe, down into India and into the Middle East, all the way around. Now, they're moving around Europe because their population is growing. They're not being forced quite unlike the Bantu, but because their population is growing, they're needing to find better locations to start up a new civilization. They're looking for more resources and better things to trade. Um, they are known as warriors, and they are fighting their way through and trying to conquer new territory from themselves. Now, they're not very organized as in empires at this point. They're just spreading out and trying to set up little towns everywhere, and that will eventually lead to cities. Now, both the Bantu and the Indian Indo-European, like I said, spread their language, which we're going to see the foundation of these Indo-Europeans are going to be the foundation of what we call the Romantic languages, English, Spanish, French, Latin, all of these are going to be founded off of these Indo-Europeans. We're also going to see metallurgy, like I said, is going to be a huge skill that is going to be pushed around Europe at this time by these Indo-Europeans, and finally, the advanced spread of technology. We're going to see not only metallurgy, but other techniques of the time for farming and other types of improvement that are going to be spread because of these. So although it's bad for them individually, for especially the Bantu, it's good for the rest of the world and has still a lasting impact today. Now, Buddhism is going to be one of the first religions we're going to talk about. Now, Buddhism has had a tremendous impact in... India as well as in China. Now it's known as the export religion because it is the most popular amongst the Silk Road and traders. Now Buddhism was created in response to Hinduism. Hinduism is very caste is caste based, caste supported. Hinduism rejects the caste and says that anyone despite your social standing can achieve heaven or achieve nirvana achieve heaven, also in Hinduism known as Nirvana. Now, Buddhism does use monasteries to achieve enlightenment, where you go and you practice and you um, try to reach a state of Nirvana or a state of understanding like the Buddha. You're also It's going to be started by Siddhartha Gautama, and he is known as the Buddha. He is the first person to reach a true understanding we're going to see that it is going to start in India, however it is eventually going to be spread out into China. And today we're going to see more, uh, more Buddhist in China than we are in India. Keep in mind in period 3 we're going to see that 
in uh, Buddhists get kicked out of India. So that's a huge reason why. But it's called the export religion because of trade. Now, the Hellenistic empires are also known as the Greek empires. There are four major types, uh, four major divisions of the Hellenistic empires. They are going to conquer city-states. They are not an empire. They create city-states. Now, the reason why they create city-states is because Greece itself is a very rocky um, country with very little fertile farming. So since the territory itself doesn't have great farming, the Greeks are now in a position to go out, because of technology, are to go out and conquer little city-states and use those to grow wheat, for instance, and import it back to Greece in order to be used by their people. Now, the Hellenistic city-states are seen everywhere, and their influences have been left behind. We have pictures of art that has been left by these Hellenistic empires, and they're still around today. Um, we can see them marking from Sri Lanka to Turkey. This shows that the Hellenistic empires were very influential, however, very diverse, because they're all over the place. Keep in mind, they're not an empire because they created city-states. Now, kind of going off on what we just were talking about back there, city-states versus empires. Empires were built by civilizations that had enough food and resources to support their civilization with a desire to expand. So if you had enough food, you had enough resources, and you were con confident that you could, people are g now starting to create empires where they're going to conquer neighboring territories. Examples of empires are going to be the Roman, the West African, and the Persian empires. They have enough food, they have enough resources, they are going to start conquering the territories around them and trying to expand their power, their um, spread of influence. Now, city-states were built by civilizations that were limited by their geography. Like we just talked about, the Greeks are a perfect example because of the rocky landscape. Another example would be the Mayans. The Mayans set up city-states because of the distance between the two, between the city-states, as well as. Um, regional separation issues as well as the Phoenicians. Now the Phoenicians are a very powerful period one civilization and they go into period two. They are major traders. They don't really have a massive empire like you think of the Greeks and the Persians because they only create city-states. They, they create or conquer little towns along ports and they use that as a way to import goods. Now, when we talk about empires, it's important to differentiate between an imperial empire and a traditional empire. Now, when we say imperial, we mean all power. That means they are hand-selected by God to rule, which means they cannot be challenged in any sense of the way. Now, an emperor is going to be a person who comes into power, who has great power because of their own skills. So an imperial one is one graced by God with the ability to rule. The, an emperor is going to be one who has the talent to essentially lead its empire, its, their people into an expansive role. Now, Imperium means power as well. We're going to see this being used best in East Asia, where they're going to create the dynastic system, which bases the approval of God on their ability to rule. Empires are going to be very popular everywhere else in the world. You really only have Imperial and China to be the best examples. So in most cases, between Imperium and in Empire, you should typically lead to Empire unless you're in China. Now, imperial expansion is the same as the expansion of an empire. They're trying to conquer as much territory, and essentially God has given them the authority to rule over extensive new empires. Period 2, as we stated at the beginning of Period 2, is all about the development of religions. Now, 
we're going to see that previous religions like polytheism, animism, and shamanism are no longer going to be very, very popular. We're going to see that they're going to start fading off and being replaced by new religions like Jainism, uh, Islam, Christianity, Taoism, okay? Because the world is getting more sophisticated and we no longer need basic explanations of why the... Uh, why the sky has thunder and lightning. We now need a more complicated, realistic understanding of um, how things work because of changing politics in a regional trade or bringing different types of people together for the first time. And we're seeing that um, these traditional religions of polytheism, animism, and shamanism are no longer satisfying the population. So because of that, new religions are going to start popping up and these religions are going to thrive. Now, one of the first religions we're going to talk about is Christianity. Now, Christianity is the second monotheistic religion. The first one, of course, is Judaism. Now, Judaism is from period one. Uh, Christianity is founded in period two. The founder is Jesus. He started, um, it started in the Holy Land, located during the time of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, the symbol of Christianity is the cross, and the holy book is the Bible. Now, it's going to be spread by trade and by the disciples. Once the disciples um, decide that they're going to start spreading it, they go to all corners of the earth, and they start spreading the religion. Now, people are going to follow Christianity and choose to follow Christianity because it appeals to all people, and, and wealth doesn't matter. This is a huge change from the polytheistic um, religions of especially the Roman Empire, but it's also going to be um, attracting the poor and women to Christianity because for the first time they feel like uh, religion is catering to them. They are going to start from the foundations of Judaism, which is Jesus was a Jew, and then his life is going to start a new religion. Please make sure when we talk about religions that you are acknowledging the symbols. In the, the symbol for Christianity is in the upper right-hand corner, and it's a cross. Now, Islam is not period two. It is period three. However, we are going to talk about it because it is one of the major religions and we're following your, your review packet. Now, the founder of Islam is Muhammad. He believes that the god Allah spoke to him and he is going to lead the world in pursuing Allah's goal. It started in period three. The symbol is a crescent moon and a star, as you can see. The holy book is the Quran, and it is spread by trade and by empire force. We're going to see that they're not going to allow forced conversion. However, they are going to take over a territory and then eventually require it to be all Muslim. People are going to follow it because it appealed to uh, traditional polytheistic belief system that was originally affiliated in the Middle East. And we're also going to see it gain um, popularity because of its self-exploration. That will really entice it, people to kind of have their own connection with God. Hinduism is going to be created during period two. Um... Hinduism has no specific founder. However, the caste system, which is the foundation of Hinduism, was founded by the Aryans in period one. However, Hinduism as a religion doesn't pop up to period two. Hinduism was formed in order to help solidify and support the caste system by the government. Now, the symbol is called an Om, as you will see there. It looks like a yoga thing, if you ask me. And it is a yoga thing. They do use it in yoga, but that's the symbol of it. The holy books are based on the Bhava Gita, which is a collection of poems, the Apshans, which are also poems, and the Vedas, which are the traditional Aryan books of explaining how the caste system is organized. Now, it is going to be spread by the government in support. Um, it's going to... Spread by the government support in India. It is used to reinforce the government system. Much like Confucianism was used to support the Chinese government system, Buddhism is used to support the Indian system of government. People are going to follow it because it appeals to the government structure first and foremost. So they're going to kind of be forcing it. And it also justifies the caste system 
which people high up on the cast enjoy, people on the bottom of the cast do not. It is going to um, analyze and explain how the reincarnation system and it is going to help you on it's going to teach you to understand how to have a better life the next time you come back to planet earth now the following religion is made in direct in direct opposition of hinduism and that's buddhism now it is going to start in india however it is going to spread mostly to china and a little bit down into um Southeast Asia. However, it's mostly going to travel up to China. Now, the founder is Siddhartha Gautama, Buddha. It is going to be founded in South Asia. The symbol is the Dharma wheel, which looks to me like a nautical wheel. The holy book is the Tipika, and it's going to be spread by trade. It's known as the export uh, religion. People are going to follow it because people who are on the lower end of the caste system were tired and frustrated of being uh, considered the lowest of the lows. So they're most likely to join Hinduism. Like I said, it's made out of um, opposition of Hinduism. Now, Neo-Confucianism. It was started by a Song Dynasty, and it's going to be based on Confucianism and Buddhism. It's a blend of the two. It's going to be started in period three. The symbols are the yin and the yang. We're going to see that the holy book is called the Book of Changes, and it is going to be spread by trade and by the gunpowder by gunpowder empires. People are going to follow because it appealed to the song because it blended Confucianism, which is very much government, pro-government, as well as um, Buddhism, which is more of an attraction for the population. So they blend it on purpose in order to get the best of both worlds, something the government likes and something the people likes. We're also going to see that it's going to be used to justify the needs of the government. Now, when we're talking about religions... Coming from South Asia, we're talking about Hinduism, Sikhism, Jainism, and Buddhism. Now, these uh, Hinduism and Buddhism specifically are going to be the most influential of the two, but Sikhism and Jainism are also going to have great influence. Now, when we look at these South Asia religions, it's important to note that um, they are all based on the blending of cultures. It's not one one dynasty or one civilization is going to create a religion that everyone else is going to adapt. It's the blending of cultures that are going to create them. Like, for instance, Sikhism is the blending of Hinduism and Islam, while Jainism is the blending of Hinduism and Buddhism, and Hinduism is pulling from the Aryan and South Asian cultures post-Aryan development. With talking of period two, you can't talk about period two without talking about the Greeks and the Romans. Now, the Greeks and the Romans are going to have a lot of cultural or cultural or artistic development and achievements, and they are going to uh, be creating some of the most famous um, sculptures, oral traditions, manuscripts, and literature. And a lot of all, most of these are either going to be based on logic or on the actual religions, which were polytheistic. Now, please keep in mind that we've discussed on many of occasions that the Greek gods are, in fact, the same thing as the Roman gods. However, the Romans got lazy and decided just to change their name instead of coming up with a new religion. So, the Greeks and the Romans are going to be using their art to celebrate their gods. And they're going to try to do whatever they can to appease their gods in order order to earn good favor. A perfect example of this would be the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, art, uh, Parthenon, all of these wonderful things are based and are, are built in honor of the gods. Now this top piece that you're going to see up here in the black and gold, that's a Greek example, while the one in granite or in marble is going to be your Romans. Now, when we start talking about the development of religions, it's important to note the development of their uh, houses of worship. Now, we're going to start with Christianity. All 
Christian churches, and we're talking about the traditional sects, of course, not these new modern churches, are going to have a steeple or a bell tower of some sort and have one long, um, one congregation room with pews. They're going to have seats or benches for their, prayer, for their religious patrons to sit. Um, up in the front of the room, they're going to have a uh, platform or a raised area where the priest will stand with um, the other uh, priests in order to lead the prayers. Around the church, you are going to see images of Jesus, uh, depending on what type of church you go into, whether it's a crucifix, an image of God, a painting of God, a stained glass of God, uh, whatever you can possibly imagine, they can do. Christianity believes in the use of images of Jesus, and they're going to use it. Now, top church is just a certain church. Uh, steeple looks like that bell tower, and that is the Sistine Chapel, which was painted, of course, by Michelangelo, and you're going to see it's all covered in people, which is actually not that common when you look at um, houses of worship for most religions. Now, Islam is going to be the exact opposite of Christianity in regards to decoration. Now, Islam, Islam's house of worship is called a mosque. Um, it is the congregational center for prayer five times a day. Every male citizen needs to be able to attend the mosque, so we're going to see that these mosques are eventually become very, very large. Now, mosques are going to have a central prayer hall, which has a courtyard and will have an area of water access where the Muslims are to wipe their hands, essentially both figuratively and literally, of sins and dirt. Now, the decorations of a mosque are very much so the opposite of Christians. They are geometric or calligraphy-based or... Um, or pictures of everyday life. No one who is mentioned in the Quran will you ever see the faces of them in a mosque. Muhammad, we have no idea what Muhammad looked like. All we know is that um, words can be written about him, but no images can be taken of him. You're going to see that mosques are required to have five minarets around it, and they represent the five pillars of Islam. Now, you can't talk about period two without talking about the Romans and the Hans. Now, the Romans are going to be formed around the region, the Mediterranean Sea region. They are going to eventually support Christianity. About 80% of their empire, they're polytheistic, and only about 20% of it is going to be Christian-based, but they are the first one to truly embrace Christianity. The poor Jews have been kicked around and removed and experienced multiple dysphoras for having monotheistic religion, but with Jesus and Christianity, it, the perspective of monotheistic religions change. We're going to see that politically it's going to evolve from a kingdom to a republic to an empire. Now, the republic is probably the most important phase, mostly because of its democracy. However, it is not the foundation of democracy. It is, in fact, the follower of Greece. The Romans are eventually going to fall from out to outside forces because of groups like the barbarians, the vandals, um, are going to come in and constantly attack the borders, and eventually they're going to run the borders and cause Ro Rome to fall. The Han are going to be formed in East Asia. They're going to use and maintain the power of the Mandate of Heaven. They have internal conflicts, which are going to make them weak, like the Yellow Turban Revolt, um, which will make their downfall a little bit faster. We're also going to see that they only have one specific, uh, only one specific opponent, which is the Exongu or the X Men, like I call them. And they're also going to be use government bureaucracy to improve the quality of life. The easiest, the fastest, and the most effective way to improve your station of life is to become a government bureaucrat by taking the uh, civil service exam.
Now, the similarities are going to be fought off outside threats of invasion. They're both going to build up the infrastructure of the religion. They're going to build roads. They're going to build canals. They're going to build aqueducts. All of these things are going to improve the quality of life of every Roman citizen. They're going to be known for their standardization, standardization of currency, of weights, and loss in government standards, which is a huge component. And finally, they're going to depend very heavily on natural resources, which will eventually lead to their demise. Now, we tile with administrative um, institutions from China. We're kind of reiterating, we just kind of talked about the civil service exam and the increasing of bureaucracy. Now, the Chinese created the civil service exam in order to figure out who are the most qualified for government jobs. These government jobs are going to be used in the fastest way to improve your station in life. Now, the exams can be taken by any person, any place, any time of their lives. However, only the highest are going to be given positions. Um, if you do take a civil service exam, you are going to have to know the past and the present government administrations as well as your history as well. So it's not just about learning your math and your science and your history, it's about being able to apply it and offering government tools. Now because of the Chinese civil service we're going to see a large development of churches, of um, schools all throughout China who are trying to make sure or trying to make sure that there are people qualified to run in this government bureaucracy. Now the Chinese dynastic cycle is going to be a big component that is going to legitimize the rule of China. Now when a strong dynasty establishes peace and prosperity, it is considered to have the mandate of heaven. It is considered to be powerful. Then in time the dynasty declines and becomes corrupt and they raise taxes and the poor grow poorer and people start getting pissed. Eventually disasters such as floods, famines, peasants revolts are going to occur. People are then going to challenge the government, and then this will lead to rebellion and bloodshed, which will give a new dynasty power, uh, restore peace and order, and claim the mandate of heaven, and then they will be the ones who are responsible until the next cycle occurs. This explains every single empire that has ever existed. Keep in mind when we talk about the mandate of heaven, it's the approval of heaven to look over the welfare of the population. Welfare of heaven doesn't mean that you can rule until the day your family dies, the last member. It's saying that you have the ability to rule now, however, it's not guaranteed. That if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you will be removed. Now, imperial governments are going to, like the Aztecs and the Delhi Sultanate, are going to use this thing called a tributary system because their empires are so vast um, as well as complicated, that they typically give themselves the opportunity to tax their new conquered land, and this gives them a little bit of autonomy if you're the new conquered land. So we're going to see that this tributary system is going to become very, very popular amongst European nations as well as with African nations nations. Now let's hit, hit it to period three. Now period three is known for its expansion of trade, spread of disease, and advancement of cultural diffusion. So people are moving in a shaken. Uh, major changes are going to be luxury goods from China are now being sold, gems from India, exotic animals from Africa. We're going to see new compasses and astrolobes, larger ships, credit system, and baking houses for loans. Now, European feudalism is going to be based on rights and obligations of a noble and a vassal. Now, feudalism is going to start because of all of the Viking raids, and people are running around in fear and in terror. So people are now offering their life and their generations of family members to these lords in exchange for the ability to... Ex uh, to avoid the random killings and raiding of the Vikings as well as um, the random killings and damages caused by just local tribes raiding and killing. 
Um, in exchange for military protection, they are going to have to farm, and fiefs are going to be um, used, or this is the land serfs work. Now, agricultural methods are also going to advance during period three. Uh, period three in these agricultural revolutions are going to transform the world we live in today and are still incredibly highly influential. The first one is going to be the three-field system, which means you plant two fields and you leave one leave fallow, which means not planted. Once the plants have grown, come and gone, you tear up all the grass, you go and you move one position over in your field, and then you leave a different field open. This allows nutrients to recover as well as um, crop rotation. Now, when we talk about, this is going to be used a lot in Europe and in Africa. Now, another agricultural method is called terracing, and I think it's probably one of the coolest. Uh, for people in mountainous ranges, they are going to cut essentially flat spaces or, um, or steps, like I like calling it, to keep water flat instead of having the water run down the surface of the mountain and not watering their crops. It's now going to be caught and used to um, feed the crops. This is going to be used successfully by the Greeks and the Mayans. Fine. Uh, we also have the slash and burn method, which is going to require that all vegeta vegetation is cut down and then it's going to be lit on fire and under a controlled burning situation is burn. Now this is going to be still used today all around the world. However, we're going to see that it is going to the oxygen and the nitrogen from the ashes are going to create nutrients for the soil. Our next type of agricultural revolution, our agricultural method is called crop rotation. It's going to use all four fields, or all fields are being planted. All fields are now being um, used. So we don't have a three field system anymore where one light field laid fallow or empty all of them are being rotated. So if you're using uh, growing corn, for, for instance, which is a lot of nutrients to grow corn, you're now going to grow corn, but in a different part of your planting system, depending on, you know, last year, the previous crop. The agricultural method of the Janat system is very sophisticated. It's perfected by the Persians. It's where holes are drilled into the river, into the face of the mountain to collect water, and this water is going to be called a this water is going to be used for an irrigation system that is going to be incredibly beneficial to the Persians. Now, one of the big things that's going to be occurring in the 11th century, so that's 1000 to 1099, is going to be the Great Schism. Now, the Great Schism is going to be when the Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic, uh, the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox religion are going to split up. So there's no longer one Christianity. There's now two types of Christianity. And the reason why he left, um, why he, as in the Eastern, your Eastern Orthodox, are going to leave is because of a challenge of the icons. The Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox are going to argue over the use of icons. Should they be used? Should they be prayed to? Or should they not? Now, the Eastern Orthodox believe they should pray to the icons and worship the icons like Mary and Joseph and all the saints, while the Romans say, no, it takes away that power from God. Now, the Romans who are fighting this are going to be most famously the Romans, while the Byzantines are going to probably be the most influential of the Eastern Orthodox. With the Great Schism, the Catholic Church divides into two, Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholicism, which will lead to a massive change for the rest of the world. Monsoon winds are also going to be discovered during period two, uh, period three, 
They are important because they allow us a reliable source of transportation and they also give us a way to manipulate our world's environment. Now, like we've talked about, religion is a huge thing that's going on in period two, overflows into period three. It's important to note that every single religion has a veneration of the dead cause, which means they are going to be honoring the previous generations and their previous family members. By honoring them successfully and proudly, you're going to earn you and your family good favor, which is a good thing. So we're going to see that every religion, whether you're Hinduism, whether you're Catholic, whether you're a Muslim, they're going to do something to honor the previous dead. Now, one of the big things that religions are really struggling with today is the ability to spread the word about these religions, specifically Christianity. Now, imperial expansion is going to be a great way that a country can force both its traditional society members as well as its non-traditional society members. We're going to see that Islam is going to be spread by conquering of territory, while Christianity um, is going to be focused by trade. Now, the Vedic religion and the Upshans, we did kind of talk about this a little bit earlier when I talked about Hinduism. They are the Vedics were written by the Aryans in their period one, which is going to emphasize the change for uh, what you do as an individual. So it's all about the change inside you. While the Upshans were written in period three, which are compiled into poems, and um, which is used to which is used almost independently, but not quite, is going to be used by most Indians, okay, of the Hindu descent, of Hindu belief. Now, the differences between the East Coast and the West Coast of Africa are pretty significant. The West Coast of Africa are going to be empires, while the East Coast is going to be civilizations. Africa's west coast are going to be a lot more isolated, which means trade in between the communities is going to be big or small. What do you think? It's going to be very big because there's so many territories and land masses, which will then lead to the creation of empires. Now, the east coast of Africa are going to formulate city-states because they're not traveling like the Trans-Saharan um, Trans pathway or trading routes that are in the West Africa, they're using ports as uh, trading ports. So they're going to have city-states while the West are going to have the Trans-Saharan trade, which are going to require more land. More land means more territory. More territory means more things you have to defend. Now, another thing that's occurring during period three is the Black Plague. Now, the Black Plague is going to start in Asia, and it is going to spread based on travel of um, rats and fleas, and it's going to travel along the trade routes. Now, we're going to see that ships and uh, Silk Road caravans are going to carry a lot of the disease from Asia to Europe, and we're also going to have about about 40, about 60 percent of the world's population is going to be killed by the Black Death. Now, the Black Death is going to be supported because the Mongol Empire did such a great job laying out roads and making sure trade moved fast that because the Mongols did too good of a job making sure that trade could um, flow very easily, the Black Death explodes through the Muslim Empire because it's moving so fast. We also kind of talked about this when we talked about feudalism earlier, that the Vikings are uh, leaving their homeland up in Scandinavia um, because of too large of populations. There's just too many Vikings up in Scandinavia, so they have to leave and they have to conquer new territory. So what they're going to do is they're going to conquer new territory as well as raid other territories in order to grow or amass some wealth. 
They're going to conquer Constantinople, and then they're going to dare, uh, dominate the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and this will eventually lead to... Um, this will eventually lead to uh, feudalism. Now, another big important traveler of PRA3 is going to be Marco Polo. Now, Marco Polo is going to be famous for his interactions with Kublai Khan, or a Mongol leader who has conquered Japan in the Wan Dynasty. Now, he is going to go in and tell stories. He's going to bring some neat little parlor tricks or neat little games or things to tell the Kublai Khan. Um, and he wins his favor and eventually will be kicked out of Russia for being a spy. But, I mean, pretty interesting guy nonetheless. Another big event that's happening in period three is the Christian Crusades. Now, the immediate impact of the Christian Crusades, the temporary land gains in Palestine for uh, Caribbean, uh, for the Christians, while the Pope is going to have a slight bump in approval and the immediate sack of Constantinople. The outcome of the sack of Constantinople will eventually lead into the creation of Istanbul, um, which is the name of the modern city of Constantinople. Um, when we talk about Christian crusades, crusades, it's important to know the papal authority is going to decline. People aren't going to take the Pope as seriously. Feudal power is also going to decline on a major scale because we're going to see that kings and monarchs are going to become more and more powerful. We're also going to see that religious tolerance is going to become much more in vogue. And we're going to see a massive increase in demand of goods from Asia because Europeans were getting accustomed to having salt, um, flavored salts, spices, as well as coffee. Zhang He, as we've talked about before, he's going to sail for the Ming. He's going to sail around the world, and he is supposed to bring back um, technolo technology from Europe or anywhere else. Well, the problem is, is that Hung He, although he had eight voyages, he is not, go is not so much intrigued by government inventions he's more intrigued by cultural things so eventually he will not be allowed to leave because he's not looking at cultural things ah, he's not looking at technology but rather cultural things and you can see that he f goes all around a uh, south asia trying to spread news that the that the ming empire exists and that they are ready and open for business here we are, period four, our last period of the midterm. Let's do this. This ranges from 1450 to 1750. We're going to see that technology is going to change with massive maritime technologies, like uh, that'll change global patterns. We're going to see uh, major empires, including the gunpowder empires. We're going to see slave trade is going to increase significantly, and... Of course, we have our demographic as well as our cultural. When we're talking about period four, it's important to note that we're going to open up trade and exploration with the Americas. Because of Christopher Columbus's uh, voyage into the New World, goods like tobacco, sugar on a large scale, as well as... Um, potatoes and maize and corn, we're going to see that European goods are going to be brought back to Europe to great success. Now, during period four, we're going to have different ways to make money. There's two systems that are essentially formulating. This will be one of the first things we're really talking about in the new um, semester is going to be the Industrial Revolution. Now, the Industrial Revolution is going to have very humble roots where women used to um, overweave their spinnings in order to have a little extra something or extra rope, whatever type of thin thread they need, um, and they are going to actually use that to make profit. So it's illegal when you're in a uh, domestic setup to a degree, 
but um, it's going to be used very, very efficiently. Now, a factory system is going to be the exact opposite of it. It's going to be a large-scale system where you are working in a factory and um, the goods are going to be sold cheaper and much more effectively. And we'll talk about that in much more detail. Now, talking about South Asia and the Americas and the administration of their government, South Asia and America are going to be uh, pretty different because... Uh, pretty similar, I mean, because they're both going to use the tributary system. Now, the Amer Mayans are going to use the tributary system because of the territory conquered. It just got so big. While India is going to use the tributary system because, A, it's its traditional system to a degree, as well as the, Dolta, uh, the, the Delhi Sultanate, which is going to try to coordinate all power through them. However, it's going to fail, mostly because they tend to focus on Islam only and not on earning the respect of the people, but trying to force them to convert without forcing them to convert. Period 4 is also going to be the dawn of the patriarchal age. <laughs> Just kidding. I mean, it's been there since period 1, but we're going to see that China is going to take a huge step backwards in dominating their women. We're going to see that during the Tang and the Song dynasties that the um, Chinese belief in foot binding is going to become more and more popular. We're also going to see that um, the belief of women to be dirty and to be um, unused after the death of their husbands or anything like that, they are going to be eradicated and no longer allowed to wed, which is limiting their life. Men can get married as many times as possible. Um, and they're going to restore the Confucian belief in the file of piety, which is the respect for the elders. And we're going to see that they're going to become a major influence once again. This is the Tang and the Song of restoring China's, um, restoring China's uh, traditional manners. Now, the Mongol Empire is going to be the largest empire that has ever existed. It is essentially going to encircle all of Asia, especially East Asia, and it's going to spread all the way into just north of what we would call the Arabian Peninsula today. So you can see how massive it is. It is the largest empire to ever exist, and its capital city is called Smarkland, and as you can see, it's right in the middle. This is a major trading city for um, the Mongolian Empire, but it is a landlocked city, so keep that in mind. Now, the gunpowder empires are going to be anything that is um, uh, anything during period four. Now, the gunpowder empires are going to see Christians, specifically the Muslim ones, as either a burden or a blessing. Now, the Seljuks, which are Turks, um, did not believe that Christians deserved any type of rights, and they were so untrustworthy they wouldn't even allow them to show up in the military. However, the Ottomans saw them on the complete opposite. It did require every Christian to go into the military. However, that was the fastest way for um, the Ottoman Turks to see the Christians' value and wealth. Well, anyway, eventually, the Christians are given the um, honor of and credit of stopping the Mongols from invading Turkey completely. So we're going to see that the Seljuk, which have no belief in uh, fairness, while we're going to see that the Ottomans are going to uh, give Christians the best opportunity they can get from the region. One of the best things about this review is the ships. Now, the Arabic Dao is going to be a three-sail triangular, while the Chinese Duke is going to be a bamboo-laced um, bamboo-based uh, sailing. Well, we're going to have the European Galleon, which is going to be your more rectangular. Keep in mind, on the exam day, you are going to have to identify a blacked-out shadow of a ship, and you're going to have to tell what type of ship it is based on where it's sailing. So please make sure you're paying attention to the locations of the sailing, not just the ships. Um, the Chinese are going to improve exploration and travel to a massive degree. They're going to you invent the compass, which will help everyone navigate the seas. They're going to create the stern rudder, 
which allows ships to be destroyed and uh, which allows ships to be steered and controlled, not destroyed. That'd be crazy. And then finally, gunpowder, which is going to be invented by the Tang, which is going to be stolen by the Abbasid Empire, which will eventually be spread to the whole world. Now, when we talk about the Tang in the song and Confucianism, we're looking at how they're trying to see China as a look back on the traditional past. They're trying to harp back onto what made China great in the early empires and the early dynasties. So the Tang are going to reinforce Confucianism. However, the Song, which is going to follow the Tang, are going to see, um, are going to use Neo-Confucianism because of the political support as well as um, the people's support of it. And it's going to be used pretty effectively. The Chinese are also going to benefit from their land conquering territory of Vietnam. In Vietnam, there is rice that has two uh, harvesting seasons in one year, which means twice as much food. It is also going to allow um, it's also going to allow um, to be planted earlier and more effectively. So it's going to take a lot faster. Um, this will eventually lead to the increase of a population as well as to a, um, a sense of power because now China has the ability to feed themselves on a much larger scale. And finally, the Renaissance. Now, the Renaissance art, as we've talked about briefly, is a Christian-based, specifically Catholic-based, um, ideology, and it is uh, all about people and the interactions of God with people and the influence of people on God, and um, it has a very realistic uh, perspective of what people look like. You're going to see some very pretty people in um, Renaissance art and some very ugly people or not typically attractive, whether our time or Roman time. Um, we're going to see that the European Renaissance is focused on Catholic churches, teaching, and symbolism. We're going to see that, keep in mind that Christianity is all about using the faces of um, Jesus and the faces of the saints and the disciples, while Muslim is not. And because of this, Christianity is really going to push ahead on art. All right, guys, that's it. I hope you have a wonderful week. I hope you're getting plenty of rest in our eating. And good luck on your other exams. More importantly, good luck on my exam. Have a great night, guys. See ya.